I wholeheartedly understand that when you're on a keto diet, it's super tough to get away from the sweets, at least at first. So a lot of times it's very, very easy to find ourselves just reaching for something artificial, something that gives us that little bit of a crutch. If you're someone that has a sweet tooth to begin with, it can be really difficult to break that away and totally rip the bandaid off when it comes to going keto. So what I wanna do in this video is I wanna help you understand how artificial sweeteners affect the ketogenic diet. But I don't just wanna talk about artificial sweeteners. I wanna talk about artificial sweeteners, I wanna talk about sugar alcohols, and I wanna talk about natural sweeteners. Okay, because they all have a slightly different process within the body, and they all affect ketosis in a slightly different way. So I figure if I put this out here, you can make your own educated decision. But I do wanna say, first and foremost, before we get into any of the science or any of the physiology, that when it comes down to artificial sweeteners, so much of it is psychological. Okay, so much of the reason that we even reach for those sweet treats is simply because our bodies are still adjusted to it, but more so because we think we need it. And a lot of times we refer to these artificial sweeteners as almost a form of methadone. Okay, it's like something like you're just giving yourself a little bit of that sweetness to get you through this transition period. And when you're going into keto, one of the things that I will say is that in the very beginning, if you have to use some artificial sweeteners to get you through that gray area, that's totally fine. But after a certain period of time, you're not gonna need them. Your taste buds are gonna change, your cravings are gonna change, your insulin response is gonna change. You'll find that you'll only need those sweet things if you continue to eat those sweet things. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's get to the science. So the first thing I wanna talk about are artificial sweeteners. Okay, we're talking about the saccharin, things like sweet and low. We're talking about Splenda, sucralose. We're talking about aspartame. We're talking about things like Equal, the little blue packets and the things that are in diet sodas and stuff like that. So first off, artificial sweeteners like this are totally synthetic, okay? There's no actual bioidentical process within the body. They're totally synthetic and they are regulated by the FDA. So the FDA does look at them to see if they're safe or not, but that doesn't always mean that they're truly safe, okay? So what we wanna look at is how these sweeteners affect you on a ketogenic diet. Now, mainly we have found that artificial sweeteners don't have a response with blood glucose or insulin. So that would lead us to believe that they're relatively safe to use on keto. Now, safe is a relative term, right? I'm not saying that they're safe for long-term use, but by and large, they're not gonna really affect your ketone levels. However, what we are finding is that sucralose is so close to sucrose, we're talking about Splenda here, that it does have an effect. But let's talk about saccharin for one second, and let's talk about equal for one second. There was a study that was published in the journal Epilepsia that took a look at test subjects that were on the ketogenic diet because they were epileptic. So this means super therapeutic processes of ketosis. We're talking like very, very high fat, very low protein, to where it would be very important to make sure that carbs are aligned properly. And what they found is that these epileptic subjects did not get kicked out of ketosis when they used saccharin, okay? So that does tell us that when it's a bona fide artificial sweetener, there shouldn't be a digestive response that elicits that blood glucose spike and an insulin spike, therefore telling us that it's ultimately safe. But it doesn't really stop there. Like I mentioned before, sucralose is considered an artificial sweetener because what they've done with sucralose is they've taken a sucrose molecule, which is sugar, and they've added chlorine to it to make it sucralose. Now it's so close to being sucrose that we're finding that Splenda does cause an insulin response. It does cause a small glucose spike. But well, one of the things that we have to factor in is that when you consume Splenda, you're usually having a good amount. Sodas that are sweetened with Splenda have quite a bit. When we're making baked keto goods and we're adding Splenda to it, we're adding quite a bit. So even though it doesn't have the same response as sugar, you are having a blood glucose response and an insulin response, which could kick you out of ketosis. And even if it doesn't kick you out of keto, it's slowing down your fat loss. It's slowing down the function of those ketones. Now, all this being said, we know good, bad, and ugly about how they respond with blood glucose, but let's look at what all of these do to the brain really quick. See, all artificial sweeteners are what are called excitotoxins. What that means is that excitotoxins trigger the influx of calcium into the brain, which kills off our brain cells. It kills off neurons. Okay, it triggers a lot of what is called excess glutamate. We have GABA, we have glutamate in our brain. They balance each other out. When we have too much glutamate, we are in an excitatory state. By that, we mean we are in this excited state where we have a lot of calcium and a lot of free radicals flowing through our brain, therefore killing off brain cells. So we're finding that artificial sweetener use over long term can definitely affect your memory, can definitely affect your cognitive function, and even contribute to Alzheimer's and dementia. So that doesn't sound scary now, but when you start thinking about the short-term effects with memory loss, it hits home quite a bit. Now, let's jump over to sugar alcohols for a second, because I think you know enough about artificial sweeteners to determine whether they belong in your life or not. 
So sugar alcohols are a little different. Sugar alcohols are usually derived from plants, and they usually have their sweetness through a variety of different mechanisms within the body. But the main thing that makes them different from artificial sweeteners is that they're not chemically derived, and they don't digest at all. So even though they're not chemical, they still don't digest, and it's simply because they're usually plant fibers that are hard to break down. So what happens is, even though they have a sweet taste as they hit your tongue, when it goes through your digestive system, they go into your small intestine and your large intestine, and they just kind of sit there undigested. And what that means is that your body has to draw a lot of water in to try to break them down. This process of drawing water in is called passive diffusion. And although it's a good thing to help eliminate these plant fibers, it does cause the plant fibers to sit there, kind of stewing in water for a bit, causing them to rot, causing them to ferment, and causing an influx of bacteria within your gut. That's why sometimes when you use sugar alcohols, like isomalt, maltitol, things like that, you get a little bit bloated, sometimes a lot bloated, and you get kind of gassy. Now, if that isn't bad enough, what ends up happening is that you end up having this change in your gut biome. You've caused so much excess bacteria, so much excess gas, that it starts skewing the ratio of good and bad bacteria. So after a while, if you do this too much, you can throw off your gut biome. Now, what about being safe for keto? Technically, they're perfectly fine for keto. You shouldn't elicit any kind of blood glucose response, you shouldn't elicit much of an insulin response, but once again, when you start using these plant fibers too much, you do throw things off. And you throw off your gut bacteria, which when people do for extended periods of time, they find that they metabolize fats and carbs different. So I've talked to a lot of people that have been using erythritol or sugar alcohols for a long period of time, and they never had a blood glucose or insulin response in the beginning. But after months and years of using them, suddenly they start to respond to them. They start to have an insulin spike, and they start to get kicked out of keto. So what is happening is your body is adjusting to the sweetness of these things coming in, and it's starting to change how it looks at them. So it can start to cause a little bit of a blood glucose response. So in short, try to just go easy on those. Now let's talk about the natural sweeteners for a second. Okay, we need to talk about stevia, we need to talk about monk fruit, honey, agave, all those things. Let me get the easy ones out of the way. Honey, agave, any of those things, even like dolcetti, which is apple nectar, date nectar, anything like that, those are all a no-go on keto. Okay, those are going to kick you out of ketosis. They definitely have carbs in them. They definitely trigger an insulin response. They definitely spike your blood glucose. You don't need to have those in the equation at all. But the two that I really want to address here, stevia and monk fruit. Stevia is still really awesome. Okay. You have these things called glycosides, these stevia glycosides, and what happens is they trigger this response within your body that is actually really powerful as an antibacterial. So not only is stevia sweet, but it also has a very powerful benefit within the body. However, once again, I guess we have to look at the bad side too. We are starting to see studies now that stevia may start to trigger a blood glucose response over time. Now, here's what's going on though. When we look at stevia, stevia is a sweet plant, okay? It's concentrated extract, it's a sweet, sweet plant. So it still triggers a little bit of this digestive response to the fact that it's sweet. So that's probably what's happening. Then when we look at monk fruit, on the contrary, monk fruit isn't really a sweet plant. What monk fruit does is it actually triggers this illusion of a sweet response. So whereas stevia is just ultra sweet, but just a tiny amount, monk fruit kind of tricks the body into something sweet. So we're seeing less of a glucose response and less of a metabolic response from monk fruit than we are from stevia. Now, I know I've touted stevia in a lot of my videos and I put it in my recipes and things like that, but that doesn't mean that you need to be using it all day, every day. A little bit's not gonna hurt you, but if you're someone that absolutely needs to have the sweetness in your diet constantly, you might wanna start looking at monk fruit a little bit more, okay? It's gonna be something that's a little bit easier on your body, but as with all things in the world of health, we might very well find in a couple of years that monk fruit elicits an insulin response to. We have to look at this with a grain of salt and realize that no matter what we do, there's always gonna be some science that conflicts. So the bona fide truth is that when you're on a ketogenic diet, you need to do whatever you can to wean yourself off of the artificial sweeteners, wean yourself off of the sugar alcohols, and wean yourself off of even the natural sweeteners. The fact is, your taste buds will change. You won't need the sweet treats constantly. You can get off the crutch, and you can focus on changing your taste buds to something that really adapts to that ketogenic lifestyle. As always, if you have ideas for future videos, you know where to put them, down in the comment section below. And please don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you can see whenever I post up a new video. I'll see you soon.